Hello, and welcome to Group 2's 2021 Senior Design Presentation on the Cahalka Road Concrete Gravity Dam. Now, to go over an outline of the presentation, we will start with a project statement, then go over a project introduction, then move to the dam design, then the spillway, outlet works, pipeline, pumps, water tank, roadway, then have a section for environmental, sustainability, and constructability. After that, we will then go over the cost estimate of the project and conclude with the final summary. The dam we designed will be located in Kajalko Creek, between the eastern border of the city of Corona and Lake Matthews. The water demand of the client is 1.8 million gallons per day, or 54.75 million gallons per month. The methodology used to calculate the capacity of the dam and the necessary amount of additional water that will be purchased from Metropolitan is the ripple method, which accounts for weather patterns and maximizes the amount that can be gained naturally. 29.92 million gallons will be purchased each month, just over half the needed amount, meaning our dam is providing for almost half of the needs with a capacity of 158 million gallons. For our dam design, three types of dams were considered concrete gravity, earthen embankment, and roller compacted concrete before the decision was made to focus on concrete gravity. A major issue Southern California industries are forced to contend with is the overuse of groundwater due to municipal and industrial demands and mining is no exception. Mining interests in Eastern Corona have tasked the project team with providing them a reliable source of clean, non-potable water necessary for their operations to replace their diminishing groundwater supply, which will diminish within the following decade through the construction of a water storage and conveyance infrastructure. The design our group is presenting is a concrete dam with an inclined intake tower, access road, and pipeline and tanks to provide the needed water. Now, on to the dam design portion of this presentation. So in the dam design portion, first we'll go over what is a concrete gravity dam. Concrete gravity dam is a dam constructed of solid mass concrete that uses its own self-weight to resist overturning and sliding forces. The concrete gravity dam can have the spillway and or the intake tower integrated straight into the dam, as indicated by the image to the right, with the spillway being integrated directly down the middle of the dam and having an intake tower just to the left of the spillway. Because they are so heavy, they require strong foundations and are commonly built upon rock foundations. Now, moving on to the dam location. As previously mentioned, we'll be constructing the project in Corona, California. Specifically, our site location will be in the southwest corner of the Cahalco Canyon Creek, just west of Lake Matthews and just east of the 15 Freeway and south of Riverside County. Reading into geotechnical reports performed in locations near the project site, we were able to determine that the first 10 feet of the ground soil is composed of clay, with the bottom layer being composed of 90% granite, at which will make our foundation for the project. Moving on to the seismic analysis portion of this presentation. First, to begin with the seismic analysis, when looking through the geotechnical reports provided, we were able to determine that at the location of the dam, there are four faults within proximity. These are the Alsinor Fault, which is the closest one in proximity, as outlined by the orange line right below the location of the dam. North of the location resides the San Andreas Fault, the San Juancito Fault, and the Sierra Madre Fault. Then, using the USGS website, we were able to get the data required to determine the peak ground acceleration at the location. From here, we were able to determine the peak ground acceleration in the horizontal and vertical direction being 0.834 G and 0.556 G respectively. Now, going on to the water capacity determination, we're able to do this using the ripple method. In the graph to the right, this is our final ripple method graph, which includes the flow with the purchased water as previously mentioned. And from here, we're able to determine the highest differential as previously mentioned was 157 million gallons. And from here, we're able to go to find the acre feedage which was 483.84, and then find the water height for our project site, which was 56 feet. Now that we have established a baseline for the required dimensions for the project, we can now show you a cross-section. Here, with the cross-section of the dam, 
On the top, we have the 16 foot width of the access road, which will be built to top the dam. To the right, we have the slope of the downstream side, which is one to one. And on the left, we have the water line of the water going up 56 feet. The total height will be 66 feet with the free board and the spillway included. And going down to the bottom portion, we can see a 10 foot depth for the foundation to be built upon the rock layer. Before we get into any calculations, I will briefly explain the forces that are seen on the cross section of the dam. To start things off, the first force is the hydrostatic pressure force. The hydrostatic pressure is the weight of the water that the surface of the dam experiences with respect to depth. The next force is the passive earth pressure force. The passive earth pressure is the weight of the soil that the shear key experiences to help stabilize the structure. Then we have the weight of the dam. The weight of the dam is the force that generates the next force, the friction force. The friction force will assist the dam on preventing sliding. The last force is the uplift pressure. The uplift pressure is created due to the seepage of the water being stored. I will point out that the hydrostatic, passive, and uplift pressure forces are simplified as resultant forces in the next slide to help with the calculations. The horizontal and vertical seismic forces are inactive unless there is a sudden ground acceleration. In this section, we take a closer look at what forces will cause the structure to potentially slide. On the left side of the screen, we can see that the resultant water force causes a 97 kips per foot push to the right. However, the friction force and resultant passive pressure gives us a combined resistant force of 512 kips per foot. This gives us a 5.24 factor of safety. On the right side, we introduce the impact an earthquake would have on the structure. As we can see, the horizontal seismic force adds another 316 kips per foot to the right. Although the pushing force increased, the resistant force of 512 kips per foot is sufficient to give us a 1.51 factor of safety. Both cases satisfy the allowable factor of safety for the respective case. In this part of the analysis, we check what forces cause rotation about the region. To the left, we see that the resultant water and uplift forces cause a combined overturning moment of negative 10,461 kips per foot clockwise. Now the weight and resultant passive pressure forces produce a resisting moment of 30,344 kips per foot counterclockwise. The resisting to overturning ratio produces a 2.9 factor of safety for this case. On the right, analyzing the structure with seismic activity, we get additional forces that cause overturning. The horizontal and vertical seismic forces produce an additional negative 18,699 kips per foot and in total, we get an overturning moment of negative 29,169 kips foot clockwise rotation. However, the resisting moment generated by the weight and passive pressure still produces a resisting moment of 30,344 kips foot. The resisting to overturning ratio produces a 1.11 factor of safety. Both cases satisfy the allowable factor of safety. Due to the mass concrete needed to build this dam, we check for shear at quarter intervals of the dam's height. We calculated that a concrete mix with a 2000 psi strength is adequate to support a shear loading of up to 20,671 kips. The final part of the dam design will be going over the shear key reinforcement, which will include reinforcement in the longitude and transverse direction as indicated to the images on the left. First, we started by calculating the ultimate moment due to the passive pressure acting on the shear key. We determined using the ACI manual and equations that the concrete cover would be 3 inches, the minimum area would be 5.82 inches squared with the spacing of 6 inches on center. This is for the rebar in the longitudinal direction. Ultimately, we'll be using two number 11 bars at 6 inches on center. For transverse, using the ACI minimum requirements determined, we'll be using number 5 bars at 12 inches on center. Now we will be talking about the spillway. The spillway is a structure which allows water to flow out of the dam in a controlled fashion when water height exceeds a certain level. This is required when the dam is at or near capacity and a large storm raises the water level in the reservoir. The expected peak flow through the creek is 3,070 cubic feet per second and was determined to be half that of the flow into Temescal Wash, for which Cahalco is a tributary. The peak flow value for Temescal Wash was taken from USGS stream gauge data. There are three main components to the spillway, the crest, channel, and stilling basin. The shape of the spillway crest is trapezoidal and has a base width of 100 feet. With a wide crest, it takes relatively little hydraulic head to achieve the desired flow rate, therefore minimizing construction costs due to extra dam height. Additionally, a trapezoidal crest, in this case with a slope of 16 degrees, 
allows a vehicle to traverse the entirety of the dam structure without the use of a bridge. Taking into consideration the head above the spillway crest required to achieve the desired discharge, as well as freeboard, the total height of the spillway crest is 6 feet. Next, the channel, which conveys the water down the face of the dam into the stilling basin, starts at a width of 142 feet and eventually narrows down to 40 feet. By narrowing the channel, the width of the stilling basin is also decreased, lowering construction costs. The height of the water is also raised, increasing the tailwater depth after the eventual hydraulic jump. Despite narrowing the channel, the water remains supercritical and enters the stilling basin with a fruit number of 8.4. Taking into consideration the height of water, as well as freeboard, the height of the channel walls are 3 feet. At the base of the channel, a hydraulic jump occurs as the water converts a portion of its kinetic energy to potential energy, subsequently raising the water height. This equates to a dissipation of 68% of the incoming water's energy. In order to dimension the stilling basin, the United States Bureau of Reclamation Hydraulic design of stilling basins and energy dissipators procedure for type 2 stilling basins was used. Outflow velocity is approximately 5 feet per second and is low enough to prevent any significant damage to the stream bed. Taking into consideration the height of water, as well as freeboard, the height of the stilling basin walls are 16 feet. The walls of the spillway, unlike the dam structure, are constructed from reinforced concrete. This becomes especially necessary in the stilling basin where the walls and height of water are relatively high, causing a large moment to develop, making flexural reinforcement necessary. With the use of number 10 steel bars, 10 inches apart throughout the basin walls, the required moment and shear capacity was met. The walls also met the required factors of safety for sliding and overturning. Now, onto the outlet works portion of the presentation. The incline intake tower is an essential component to our design. The tower will be capable of drawing water from the reservoir and transporting it to the pumps where it will then be pumped up to the storage tanks. In areas of high seismicity where a vertical tower may not be feasible, an inclined intake structure supported against the abutment has the advantage of increased stability over a vertical structure. The inclined intake tower will be located north of the dam and Road 1 will connect to the entrance of the operation room of the tower, as pictured in the photo to the right. There are two main hydrological features the inclined tower must provide. The first is drainage of the reservoir for emergency purposes. The second is drainage of the reservoir for operational purposes. Drainage of the reservoir for emergency purposes is required by the Division of Safety of Dams, which states the water tower must be able to drain 50% of the reservoir in 7 to 10 days and 100% of the reservoir in 20 to 30 days. For operational purposes, the water tower must initiate the water system designed to meet the client's water demand. Therefore, the water tower will be connected to the pump station by way of a pipeline, which will transfer the water that will be pumped to the water tanks. To accommodate the emergency release criteria required by the Division of Safety of Dams, we took our volumetric capacity of the reservoir and determined the discharge demand required to drain the reservoir within the allotted time as seen on this table. We chose to focus on the discharge demand for the 10-day period since it gave us the lowest demand within our critical period of 7 to 10 days. With this information, we use the orifice discharge formula to determine the sizing of the orifice openings that would allow the water into the incline tower at an appropriate rate. Based on our hydrological analysis, we determined that our incline tower would have 12 inch diameter orifice openings that stagger along the walls of the incline tower at 5 feet increments. The incline tower will also have a 36 inch diameter pipeline attached to its base that will deliver water to the pump station on the downstream side of the dam. This pipeline was sized to allow for sufficient room for internal maintenance and necessary flushing of the pipe due to sediment buildup. Onward with the geotechnical considerations for the inclined intake tower. According to ASC 7, the minimum required factor of safety for slope stability analysis is 1.5 for static and 1.1 for seismic. Because a geotech analysis wasn't conducted, assumptions had to be made about the cohesion, the unit width of the soil, and the angle of internal friction. 
To determine whether the existing soil profile was adequate to place the intake tower, a slope analysis using GeoSlope was conducted. Using the software, we found that the existing soil profile has a safety factor of 1.49. To be more conservative with our design, our decision is to grade the existing surface so that the structure rests on an angle of 20 degrees. The resulting safety factor is 1.72. The formula we used considers properties of the soil, the weight of the intake structure, and the angle of inclination. To be in the structural portion of the incline tower, we'll first be going over some structural details. The structure we composed of reinforced concrete, and when designing the dimensions, we will take into consideration dead loads, seismic loads, and hydrostatic loads. And then for ACRI requirements, we were to determine that the minimum wall thickness would be one foot. As seen in the image below to the left, we can find the dimensions with an 8 foot by 8 foot interior and a 10 foot by 10 foot exterior, with the total length from the slope going down from the top to bottom being 268 feet. For the stability of the structure, we'll be incorporating the shear keys along the bottom of the slope going into the ground. For the dimensions of the shear keys, it is depth of 5 feet, a thickness of 1 foot, and the width of 10 foot. They'll be spaced 13 feet apart. And taking into consideration that, along with the total length, we'll be incorporating 17 shear keys in total. The final portion of the incline tower, we'll be going over the reinforcement for the shear keys. Using the ACI manual equations and the ASCE low combination, we were able to determine an ultimate moment and calculate the minimum area required, which was 3.27 inches squared. For this, we'll be using a two piece bundle to meet that and determine that the concrete cover would be three inches and would have a spacing of six inches on center. Ultimately, we'll be using two number 14 bars of six inches on center. Below in the images is the diagram of the tower with the forces acting upon it and a cross section of the shear key reinforcement. Now, on to the pipeline portion of this presentation. I will now give you all a brief introduction of our pipeline design. To the right, you will see an aerial view of our pipeline. It will consist of 3,522 feet of ductile iron pipeline, which will run from the inclined intake tower to the pump station and lastly to the tanks. The pipeline will be buried three feet below our roadway and is designed to fit the demand of 1.8 million gallons throughout a daily nine hour period. I will now pass it along to my colleague to discuss our pipeline diameter. Our pipeline system will consist of two different sized pipelines. The first will connect our intake tower to our pump station and will have a 36 inch diameter producing a velocity of 2.1 feet per second. Our second pipeline will connect our pump station to our water tank and will have an 18 inch diameter producing a velocity of 8.4 feet per second. These values are based off the demand flow rate of 14.85 cubic feet per second necessary to meet the daily water demand. Pipeline will be placed from the intake tower to the pumps and along the proposed dirt road to the tanks. We have chosen to leave one foot wide embedments for support. To lay the 36 inch pipe, a trench having a depth of 6 feet and a width of 5 feet will be excavated. And to lay the 18 inch pipe, a trench having a depth of 5 feet and a width of 3 feet will need to be excavated. A cover of 3 feet from the surface will be left for deflection purposes for both pipes. A compaction of at least 80% proctor density for the soil is recommended. Trench 1 will stretch 267 feet and Trench 2 will stretch 3,255 feet. Performance limits for buried pipe are determined by considering internal pressures, strength of materials, and safety factors. Through calculation, we found the pipes have to be a minimum of 15 inches to resist loads caused by handling and installing and external pressures. The actual wall thicknesses of the pipes will be 0.3 inches. To determine the max allowable deflection, we considered factors such as the dead weight of soil above the pipe and live loads such as those of a standard truck. The allowable deflection for the pipe is 0.3 inches and the actual deflection of pipe 1 is 0 0.09 inches and 0.37 for pipe 2. Okay, the rust in the pipe is caused by internal pressures and changes in direction of flow as well as at special connections such as valves. The thrust must either be resisted by the pipe itself, the soil, and external support, or a combination of those. We found that for 45 degree bends, the thrust force would be 66 kips, and for 90 degree bends, the thrust force is 122 kips. The pipe will be welded where the pipe diameters and wall thicknesses are equal, and 
they will be connected by flanges where the pipe diameters are different. The required restraint lengths for the 45 degree angles are 75 feet and 180 feet for 90 degree angles. The areas of the thrust block which will rest against the soil are 33 feet squared for the 45 degree angles and 60 feet squared for the 90 degrees. Now moving on to our pipeline final recommendations. As stated in the previous slides, our pipeline length is 3,522 feet. Our pipeline will have a nominal diameter of 19.5 inches and an interior diameter of 18 inches and will be excavated 3 feet below our roadway. Our pipeline material we chose is ductile iron due to its strength, durability, and its cost efficiency. The pipe will be coated with a cement mortar lining which will reduce its susceptibility to corrosion and will have a wall thickness of 0.3 inches. We will now get into the pumps we chose for our system and the analysis behind it. A pump is a mechanical device that serves to help the fluid overcome the friction losses and height difference from the source to the desired destination. There are typically two classifications for pumps, positive and non-positive displacement pumps. For our design, we decided to use non-positive displacement pumps or centrifugal pumps which work by an impeller which rotates and applies centrifugal forces to the incoming water from the eye and then discharging the fluid through the outlet. We chose centrifugal pumps to be the most appropriate for our design as it not only allows for slippage in case of extreme events but is also least susceptible to malfunctions. To meet the client's water demand, our pumps must be able to produce a certain amount of head to obtain the required velocity within our main pipeline. Given our discharge demand of 14.85 cubic feet per second and our proposed 18 inch diameter pipeline, we need a velocity of 8.4 feet per second to get the job done. With the help of Bernoulli's equation established right after the pump and ending at the top of the water tank, we determined that a pump head of 332 feet will give us our desired velocity and ultimately our desired demand flow rate within the nine hour operational period. Once our hydraulic analysis was complete, we were able to make final decisions on the pumps and the criteria they must meet. As mentioned before, we plan to use centrifugal pumps and these pumps must be manufactured to overcome a head of 332 feet based on our analysis. The pumps must have a bare minimum efficiency of 80% and according to our calculations, must produce a power output of 280 horsepower. Finally, we plan to have a total of two pumps, one actively running over a daily nine hour period and one precautionary pump in case of failure or maintenance. I will be going over the pump station. The pump station will contain both pumps and be used to maintain the pump. The pump station will be located at the bottom of the dam there are three feet to the right of the spillway, and we have stairs leading down to it from the top of the dam. The pump station will be constructed out of concrete. The ground, the ground floor of the pump station will be 8 feet tall, 18 feet wide, with a 28.62 foot roof and a 18 foot long floor. The underground floor will, will contain both of the pumps and will be will be 8 feet tall by 18 feet wide and 18 feet long. Thank you. Now onto the water tank portion of this presentation. We will now be going over the introduction of the water tanks. In the picture, you can see an aerial image of the general project layout. The water tanks, access roads, concrete dam, and the pipeline have been labeled to make it easier to distinguish between them. The water is being supplied from the concrete dam by being pumped north through the pipeline and towards the water tank. The concrete dam has an elevation of 830 feet, while the water tank has an elevation of 1,062 feet, creating an elevation difference of 232 feet. Now, we will be talking about the purpose of the water tanks. The mining conglomerates requires 1.8 million gallons of water to be pumped per day. Because water is constantly being pumped in and out of the water tanks, the water tank has to have a minimum capacity of 450,000 gallons of water. The fire department requires a minimum of 3.15 million gallons of water to be stored in the water tanks 
in case of an emergency. The water tank designed will have a total capacity of 3.6 million gallons of water in order to fulfill those requirements. To calculate the minimum volume, we decided to use the cumulative demand curve. We know from previous calculations that the daily water needed for operations is 1.8 million gallons. Using the time frame given by the client, we subtracted the commutative outflow by the commutative inflow. From the chart, we can see that the water tank capacity reaches 450,000 gallons at 4 p.m. and reduces back to 300,000 gallons at 5 p.m. to complete the loop. However, the Riverside Fire Department requires 3.15 million extra gallons of water for emergency use. This brings our total to 3.6 million gallons. Building one tank this size would be too big, so we decided to construct two identical tanks with dimensions of 30 feet high, a radius of 50 feet, and with a total volume of 1.8 million gallons. We follow the American Waterworks Association D100 for grounded water tank design. The materials that will be used is a class 2 which corresponds to A36 steel. The thickness of the plates that will be used will be 3 eighths of an inch. Some of the forces we consider in our design are the dead load, hydrostatic pressure, and wind or seismic, whichever governed. The factors that we were most considered are the overturning, sliding, soil bearing, and material stress limit. We also consider many design cases such as when the tank is at max capacity, half capacity, and empty. When the tank is at full capacity, the forces from the convective zone produce the highest surface pressures due to the sloshing of the water. From the water tank image, we can see that the colors range from light pink, which has low stress, to dark blue, where it's most stressed. The maximum stress were found were located to be 10 feet from the foundation and is to be 19,700 psi compared to the allowable from AWWA D100 Table 3 to be 21,000 psi. Now I will explain the foundation and anchorage system that will support the water tank under the critical case. We have a foundation volume of 649 cubic feet and a slab volume of 16,552 cubic feet per tank. For the anchor system, we used a maximum normal tension and compression forces found from SAP 2000. Using Simpson's strong tie designer software, we were able to find the most optimal anchor bolt. We found that 3 fourths F1554 grade 36 has enough strength to resist the maximum loadings found in the picture below. The bolt will be applied every foot on center totaling 304 bolts per tank. For the adhesive set 3G will be applied to the hose and set to rest for 30 minutes before the bolt is installed. Finally, I'll be talking about the excavation of the water tank's location. Due to the uneven slope of the location, an excavation of 7,532 cubic yards will be required to flatten the area to an elevation of 1,058 feet. Now, on to the roadway portion of this presentation. For the roadway design, we have designed the roadways to be the best cost-effective roads by analyzing the profiles, cross-section, cut, and fill volumes. We have designed these two roads as can be seen on the map where road number one, the one on the left, connects Eagle Canyon Road to the concrete dam and go over the dam to reach a hammerhead turnaround area. Also the road will have two turnouts that are close to the middle of the road and this road will be a one lane road. The second road will be about 1600 feet away from the dam. This road will connect the water tanks to Eagle Canyon Road and it will be curved into Eagle Canyon Road for easier access. Also, the road has one turnout area in the middle of the road, and it's one lane road as well. Next, we will discuss the roadway's design in details. For an overview of what we'll be discussing for the roadway, we'll start with the hammerhead turnout that is east of the concrete dam, and then we'll go to road one, which includes the turnout for the intake tower. And road one will also include a retaining wall detailing. And then when we're done with road one, we'll go over to road two that connects Eagle Canyon Road to our tanks. Here we have the hammerhead turnaround located at the east end of the dam. 
Using a three-point turn, it allows vehicles to turn around to leave the dam facilities and return to the main road. This design was chosen for its smaller size, being approximately 37% smaller by area when compared to a cul-de-sac with a 28-foot radius. It was sized for utility vehicles but can accommodate vehicles up to 24 feet in length and requiring a 28-foot turning radius. Our road one starts at the concrete dam at ele elevation 897 feet and goes all the way to Eagle Canyon Road at elevation 1009 feet with a total length of 750 feet and an average grade of 15%. Both the concrete dam and the inclined intake tower show share this road and is connected by this turnout as shown on the topographical map. Here's a different view to see the access road more clearly in elevation. There is another turnout more south, closer to the concrete dam. With this many turnouts, drivers should have no problem turning, finding a place to turn around along this road or park. This includes turnout here closer to the dam and the intake tower turnout slash entrance, as well as the hammerhead turnout on the east side of the dam. This road will have a retaining wall going all the way up to Eagle Canyon Road, but stops just before Eagle Canyon Road at elevation 1000 feet. It will have a total length of 700 feet and an average grade of 15%. This is a cross section of the road and retaining wall. For the road, it's going to be 16 feet wide. This includes two shoulders on each side of the road. It's going to have a grade slope of 6%. This is for drainage to the sides of the road. This is so water doesn't pull up in the center and it drains off to the side where the shoulders are at. There's also going to be weep holes going along the retaining wall and drains into this PVC pipe that's also going along the wall. For the retaining wall, we use the Caltrans Retaining Wall Type 1 2018 Standard Plan. We chose to use the Caltrans Standard Plan because it fit everything we needed to do. This is because the max distance between the pr proposed road and the existing terrain was 5 feet. So this was perfect since this was a, a relatively small wall. In the profile chart on the left, the orange line represents the new design roadway and the blue line represents the existing sloped hillside. You can see that the new road almost sits on top of the existing hillside. The road was designed following the contours of the hillside to reduce the cut needed. The design results in a cut fill ratio of 0.57. Hello, seen here is the access roadway for the water tank located 1600 feet due north of the dam site. It is a compressed dirt road connecting southbound along Eagle Canyon Road, bending west into the tank site. The road design is that of a 12 foot wide single lane road with a run of 450 feet and rise of 37 feet, featuring two foot shoulders on either side, an average grade of 8% and a turnout of approximately 2,400 square feet. These features were necessary in order to meet design criteria. The 18 stations spaced 25 feet apart gives us the road profile seen on the image on the left. The existing roadway profile is indicated in blue and the new proposed roadway profile is indicated in orange. The new roadway was designed keeping the grade constraint in mind and gave us the average grade percentage of 8%. Adding stations every 25 feet also allowed us to capture cross sections to gather cut and fill values. For the second roadway, we calculated a total cut volume of 921 cubic yards and a total fill volume of 4,210 cubic yards, which gives us a cut and fill ratio of 0 0.22. To summarize our road weight, each roadway is created with design constraints and specifications in mind. The requirement is for a maximum grade of 16%. We use the average end method to determine cut and fill. 
These are single lane roads with two shoulders on each side with a minimum of one turnout. Drainage is also expected to occur naturally along the slope of the road. We have a total length of about 1900 feet. We have an average grade for road 1 of 15%, 10% for road 2, and 15% for the retaining wall. We have a total cut of about 6,000 cubic yards and a total fill of about 7,000 cubic yards. With a total of four turnouts, this includes the hammerhead turnout. Now onto the environmental sustainability and constructability portion of this presentation. There are a few environmental concerns while building a concrete gravity dam. Our team used a CEPA checklist and found that the most concerning are the aesthetics, biological resources, geology, hydrology, noise, greenhouse gas emissions, land use, wildfires, air quality, energy, and hazards during construction. The unavoidable environmental impacts are ruining the scenic vista, affecting wildlife by preventing them from traversing the area, generating greenhouse gas, diverting water flow, and potentially exposing workers to natural hazards like wildfires and earthquakes. But many of these can be mitigated to a certain extent. Construction mitigation, emergency planning, and federal regulations. To protect water sources, we will take several actions to ensure wastewater from our construction site will be cleansed before it is added back to our natural water bodies. Seed fences will be used around the construction site to trap a lot of the polluted wastewater so that it can be treated and cleared of sediment that's created by adding polyacrylamide. To avoid polluting the air, we will ensure the construction technologies and vehicles that operate on fossil fuels. We use voluntary retrofit diesel engines with built-in pollution reducing mechanisms that filter out toxic materials from the exhaust gas. To avoid disturbing local residents with noise, we will ensure we have reasonable work hours that do not extend too early into the morning or too late into the night. We will have a phone line open to ensure that any local requests or complaints related to work hours are heard and addressed. We will also have a strong local outreach program to tamp down any opposition to the project and draft publicly available emergency plans of action that will be modified with each safety test. A carbon footprint and life cycle assessment are used to record and analyze the impacts on the environment throughout the entire life cycle of the dam. This analysis considers the following stages. In the material production stage, the primary materials used in mixing conventional concrete are cement, sand, and aggregate. For the proposed dam, the composition includes cement, sand, aggregate, fly ash, and other air entering agents. In terms of fossil fuels such as diesel and gasoline, involved in the production phase is also included in this section. During the transportation stage, lots of fossil fuels such as diesel and gasoline are consumed by the vehicles. The working loads of the vehicle need to be decided by the weight of the transported materials and by the distance between the manufacturing locations and the construction site. This is reliant on the contractor and where they purchase their materials from. In the construction phase, the emissions are primarily generated from on-site equipment, which consumes a lot of energy and electricity while operating. The electricity and fossil fuels consumption factors of these equipment need to be taken in account while looking at the carbon emissions during this phase. In the operations and maintenance stage, the type of maintenance required on the roadway as well as the dam and the spillway should be taken in account. The treatments also depend on the traffic index of the newly established road section. All the equipment and the energy used during these maintenance period will account for the carbon emissions during this phase. Climate change is one of the greatest global threats and its major contributor is human activity. In order to aim for sustainable outcomes, we must understand the impacts human activity has on climate change and reevaluate our construction process approach. Adapting to climate change means acting to direct and condense the consequences due to the increase of climate change. Adaptation plans have come to play an important role on reducing the impacts of changing climate patterns in order to protect and restore communities affected. 
Embedding adaptive measures will reduce the cost and extent of remedial actions and improve environmental regulations and quality. In conclusion, we will pursue adaptation goals targeting public health, water, forestry, transportation, and energy. There are definite long-term effects caused by building a dam in the environment. The most major is towards wildlife and surrounding ecosystems. The location of the dam is close to Lake Matthews and is still Mountain Wildlife Preserve. And building a dam there will prevent animals from traversing the area. Preventive measures that can be taken, for example, are watershed management involving soil conservation and catchment restoration that can reduce erosion and sediment inflow to the reservoir. Now we are going to talk about constrictability. Constrictability is on part a reflection to ensure that the major issues are addressed early in the process to facilitate a fair and accurate bid. In this part of the project, we are going to identify some issues that the contractor will encounter in the beginning of the project. In this project, the use of a concrete batching will be used. Concrete batching is a facility for mixing and blending concrete ingredients skillfully to produce a uniform quality of concrete desired strength. Construction materials include fine and coarse aggregates, cementation materials, water for washing the aggregates, mixing, curing of the concrete, and chemical admixtures. A contractor should plan out how to efficiently purchase or rent equipment source materials and transfer them to the workplace. The purpose of construction layout is to transfer reference points and alignments from the design drawings to the site to enable a construction design. And this is important for the contractor to know where to start. I will be talking about the temporary roadways and constraints. Temporary roadways will be added for the contractors to access the worksite. The pathway on the top right shows how to go to the worksite from the Interstate 15 Highway. A permit will be required when making these temporary roadways by the Riverside Building Department. After analyzing the worksite, the constraints that will be taken into mind are to avoid anything that will impact the local community and the wildlife in a negative way. There are also designated areas for the essential equipment such as heavy machinery, power generators, etc. to the contractor's liking off of Eagle Canyon Road as you see on the bottom right. All transportation will follow local and federal state requirements to avoid citations throughout the transportation as well as on the site. Now, onto the cost estimate portion of this presentation. For the total cost, we will be conducting a class 5 order of magnitude estimate. According to the AACE, this will yield us an expected accuracy range of plus 30% to minus 50% of the total value. On the table to the left, we can see a list of all the different aspects taken into consideration for the estimate, everything from the volume of concrete to the placement of roadway, earthwork for cut and fill, and retaining wall. Along with these, we calculated three more parts. By using the sum of the previously mentioned pieces, we were able to calculate an additional 50% for environmental and design permits each and a 30% contingency. After calculating all these different parts, we were then able to find the total estimated cost to be approximately $74.8 million. Looking at the pie distribution chart on the right, we can see that the volume of concrete required for the project takes up a majority of the total estimated cost, with the contingency and earthwork taking up the next most, most substantial portions of the total cost. Again, our total cost is estimated to be $74.8 million. Now, to conclude with the summary of the presentation. To begin the summary, our team's objective was to find a solution to replacing the currently diminishing water supply of several mining companies located in Corona, California. Our proposed solution was the construction of a water storage and conveyance system. In order to meet the solution, the team designed a concrete gravity dam with a water reservoir large enough to meet client demands. At the concrete gravity dam was also designed a pump station. Just north of the dam, the team also designed an incline intake tower connected to the pump station via piping. A pipeline was then designed leading from the pump station to the water tank location. The water tank location contains a dual water tank system designed by the team. 
in order to reach the water tank location, the intake tower, and Concord Gravity Dam. The team then designed two access roads leading from Eagle Canyon Road to the proposed locations for the project. Following all this, the team then performed the necessary sequel analysis to meet environmental regulations and conducted a Class 5 cost estimate of the project. In summary, this design would provide the clients with the adequate means of obtaining a replacement to their currently diminishing water supply and prove far more sustainable and reliable in meeting water demands for future mining operations. I would like to thank you for watching this presentation and will now open the floor to questions.